Welcome to the Ethnic American channel. Today's topic is going to be about how the Western genre is part of Ethnic American culture because bronze cowmen made it so. First thing we're going to talk about is the origin of the word cowboy. So what's commonly accepted is the Spanish word and the French Portuguese word for cow hand or cattle driver is vaquero and that is where cowboy came from because of the Spanish that first brought over cattle to the Americas. So if you also go on websites like Pora.com, you'll see people answering the question, was the term cowboy a derogatory word used for bronze cattlemen back in the day? And these foreigners who answer will say, no, it wasn't. But we know in context that if you call a grown man a boy, that's considered an insult. And back in the day, bronze men were called boys insultingly, not in a friendly manner. Because Caucasian cattle drivers were called cow hands, or those who worked on the farms with the cattle were called cow hands, and bronze men were called cowboys. Despite the West being slightly less, a little bit less racist, not as many lynchings happening over there, they were still racist, so they still disrespected the bronze men over there. So the Spanish slash Portuguese word vaquero does not denote a cowboy. It simply means cattle driver. Okay. When the Spanish came over to South America, they started training what we know today as the Native Americans down there. But the Native Americans they were training down there were really the mestizos or the mulattoes that they had already mixed with by that time, um, who were then loyal to Spain. Okay. And then in North America, when the, um, the Indians, both the bronze ones and the Mongoloid ones, were being assimilated, you had some of the Indian boarding schools that were teaching some ranching skills to the youth. Um, however, the point of that was to actually teach them how to farm to replace us as farmers, but it didn't work. As I pointed out in a, um, another post of mine on Instagram, a lot of the Mongoloid Indians didn't want to farm. They just didn't want to do that. They wanted to continue to live off the land. And also, it goes against their belief of no one really having the ability to own land. So... The concept of working on a ranch, which is owned by somebody, didn't really take with a lot of the Mongoloid mm -hmm. Indians. So most of them just continued to live off of the lands, which is why you had a lot of conflict, um, you know, during the expansion in the West and the Midwest going on during that time. So like I just mentioned, um, cattle raising, or what we know as um, the, the viquero, or the cattle hand, cattle driver, actually originated from Spain because the Spanish were the first ones from Europe to come over here and so they brought their cattle with them like how they brought their pig and they, the sheep and stuff like that that are not native to America. Okay, so it reads here, cattle raising was small scale and of subordinate importance in Spain except in the estuary and marshland below Seville, it was located in Spain. And then to the right here it says traditional 19th century patterns of livestock herding in different regions of the Iberian Peninsula, Iberia is another word for Spain were already established in Roman times and, but, and changed but little during the Islamic period. The Islamic period is when the bronze people ruled Spain and Europe as a whole as the Moors. Yet late medieval Spain was not a great ranching frontier, but an agro system with farming and livestock raising always accompanied, or I'm sorry, always formed a complementary but interlinked economy. So basically, cattle driving wasn't that popular in Spain. They didn't even have what we call a great ranching frontier, which is wide expanses of land for a lot of cattle to graze upon. They didn't have that, so why did it become so popular in America? Why did cattle driving and becoming a cow man or cow hand or cow boy become so popular in America, which created the Western genre? Because we did it. And before I get into that, we're going to talk about the horse itself, because they lie and say the horse went extinct in America around 11,000 years ago, but as you can clearly see here, this is rock art in Peru. So this is now 11,000 years old. It's relatively recent. And we read here, the first documented arrival of horses on the mainland near what we now call Mexico City was in 1519, okay? That's when the Spanish first brought their horses to South America. The Spanish took meticulous records of every mare and stallion. The first recorded sighting of native people with horses, however, was in 1521, and that was in the Carolinas. 
No Spanish horses were recorded as missing during this period, and there's no way Spanish horses could have made it through the dense forest and swampland to the Carolinas and repopulated in just two years. Let me read here to the right. When Columbus came, the Spanish had just finished an 800-year war with the Muslims, the Ghanas, the Moors. Queen Isabella gathered every horse in the vicinity, and those horses became part of her army. And with that horse power, she was able to conquer the Muslims, again, the Moors, which means if there were horses there, there, we were riding horses there, too. We had horses in Egypt. We had horses all over the place, okay? So that's riding horses not nothing new to us. So the horse was incredibly valuable. and You'll find paintings of her on those beautiful palominos, which is a type of horse. And the horse was very much connected with nobility, power, and the concept of civilization. That is why they so blatantly lie about horses going extinct here. To make it seem as if we didn't have a real civilization here. Because well, horses, a horse is a form of transport. Horses you can use to build an economy. Horses you can use to hunt and cross long distances, especially in a group, without using your own feet. You can go on for longer. And you get to places quicker. So horses were very important for civilization. And it was also looked at, as it said here, with nobility and power because it represents you taming a wild animal uh, for a greater use and that you're also sitting up top of a large animal and looking down upon the people. Now I gotta ask, well, what happened to the horses? Well, the same thing will happen to the buffalo because you got native um, uh, horses here. They're just in very small amounts and really all the horses that come over here whether they're from in Europe or Africa or whatever, they're all technically the same species of horse. So they all can interbreed and make a ho another horse. But the horses that were already here in America were nearly killed off, just like how all the buffalo were nearly killed off, just so we couldn't use them because they weren't killing off all these animals to try and starve out or defeat this very small population of Mongoloid Indians. That made no sense, okay? And when they went and they slaughtered the buffalo, they slaughtered them during the mid-1870s, actually um, right after so-called slavery um, was had ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. And yeah, you had Caucasian slaves, but the government was really worried about us going back to doing what we were doing and living off the land and not needing them anymore because right after slavery ended, you had sharecropping and such. So all this was going on at the same time, okay? So the bison lived from Mexico all the way up to Canada, and they went and they went the entire span of where the buffalo lived, and they almost killed them all. That's how determined they were. So don't think they couldn't have killed off the American horse because they almost killed off the American buffalo, okay? So slave masters wouldn't teach their slaves slash their workers in denture service really how to ride horses, especially our people. We had Caucasian slaves. So how did we learn how to drive cattle during slavery and onward? Because what's strange is they said that during slavery we were helping with the horses and with the cattle, but in some states or in some parts of states, it was illegal for a bronze man to ride on a horse. What does that make sense? Well, that means the master couldn't have taught you. So how do we know how to ride horses? We were already riding horses because there were already horses here. That's how we knew. Not only were we riding already, already riding horses, we were already breaking horses too. Okay, because you're not going to catch a bison with a traditional ground trap, and you're not going to run it down on foot. You're not going to run a deer down on foot either. You need a horse. Okay? And again, we weren't taught by foreigners how to ride and break these horses. We were already doing that, and they lied about the horses going extinct here to hide that. So we're going to take a quick look at this video. It doesn't have any sound because I really want you guys to pay attention to how fast these bison are running. And by the way, bison can, can get up to a ton. A ton is 2,000 pounds. Look how fast that thing is. You're not going to catch a thing on foot. And look how vast the herds are. How are you going to herd that into some kind of trap? And even if you had dogs with you, which we did have American dogs that they also went wiped out because they didn't want us to use them, they'll be trampled. So the best strategy here is to ride a horse and keep shooting it until it can't run no more. Simple but effective. Whether it be with a gun or a bow and an arrow. So it takes a lot of skill to ride and shoot at the same time. Caucasians didn't teach us that. We already knew how to do that. We were already doing that. Now we go back to the Western genre itself. The Western genre focuses on the adventures and the stories of cowboys and outlaws and settlers taming the wild west and the west frontier. Okay, mainly in states, states like Texas, Utah, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, places like that, right? And going on towards California. 
Now, there were not a lot of Caucasians during this time, remember that. The, the mass immigration that happened for the Caucasians and the Europeans in general, the Asians, all of them happened in the 1900s. So who was helping them expand into the West? Well, obviously it was us, because we already were here, and we were here in more numbers than them. In fact, we were so um, populous that the Bronx people that were already in the West that they encountered, they called them prairie niggas. Because let's not play no games, Mongoloid Indians were not referred to as niggas because nigger comes from the word niggerly, which means a stingy person. So we were called niggers because we wouldn't give the land up and they wanted the land in the West. So we were called prairie niggers because we lived in the Great Plains and some of us were a part of certain tribes like the Apache and the Sioux and the Crow and all that stuff who was fighting the Caucasians. Or we were just there living. We already had land, land and a uh, nation over there. And look what else they called us. Red nigger. <laughs> Tree nigger. Why would they call us a red nigger? I thought the red man was supposed to be the Mongoloid Indians. Because remember, Mongoloid Indians did not believe in owning land. So how how could this be? Now, if you take a look at um, a little Crayola, the um, crayon company's history... They used to have a color called Indian Red, and they still have the color. They just changed the name to Chestnut. And I put the um, color Copper, Crayola Copper color crayon, right next to the um, Chestnut, the Indian Red color, because I want you to see how close they are together, because Chestnut or Indian Red is really a reddish brown. It's not really a red red. So I would say that red also could apply to our people, too. Because you have different shades of copper and you have a reddish copper. So some of our people had a reddish copper skin tone, but they still had the look of an ethnic American. They weren't Mongolo Indians, so they were called red niggas. The prairie niggas. Because let's not make no mistake, this is what chestnut looks like as a skin tone. It's going to be on a bronze person, okay? It's a type of copper color shade skin tone. You don't see any Mongolo Indians today who have the skin tone okay so we were already over the midwest that's who was helping the caucasians so-called tame the midwest because there were not enough of them when you watch these western movies and these tv shows and these books and they want to show you just all caucasians no 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 no. they had a lot of help okay so the other thing that was also going on at the time was the homestead act that was passed in 1862 during the Civil War, actually, and provided that any adult citizen or intended citizen who had never borne arms against the U.S. government could claim 160 acres of survey government land. Um, and so you had a lot of bronze people who lived in the South uh, move to the West because eventually, in around the early 1870s, sharecropping came about after the slaves had been so-called free, right? And a lot of the bronze people in the South said, hey, we're tired of the lynchings, we don't want to share crop or you know rent the land from you we want to own our own land our own farm and get away from you guys so a lot of them moved to the west and here is a picture of a family of or a community or a group of brown people who did just that okay so here as we can um read here taylor describes peter anderson who was a bronze man who in 1863 wrote an editorial in the pacific appeal calling for blacks quote unquote to see their economic destiny in the great west Anderson called the West an endeavor to infuse into the minds of these freedmen the importance of agriculture that they may become producers because it was mainly us who was doing all the farming and the agriculture. Sarah R. Massey and Black Cowboys, wrangling the numbers, argues that Taylor is incorrect in his estimation of the number of Black Cowboys in the West. She agrees with Durham and Jones that Black Cowboys total one-third of the Western population, if not more, because you had this mass migration of bronze people move to the West. So, of course, it's not, it's not going to be no 15% bronze men or even a quarter. It's going to be at least a third, okay? Because that includes the bronze men that were moving from the South and the ones that were already there. Because it wasn't just the ones that were living on the plains. It was also, they did not count the ones that were on the ranches, who care for the horses or those wranglers who maybe didn't traverse whole states. They may just stay in their one state or stayed on their ranch and their farm. But they're considered cow men or cowboys too. But they weren't counted. So there were a lot more bronze cowboys than was let on. And here are a couple of old posters talking about, you know, moving to the West to get all that land after the Homestead Act was passed, okay? So we got to remember there were not a lot of foreigners here, okay? There's more of us than there were of them. 
So people ask the question, well, how were bronze people able to accumulate 19 million acres of land in such a short period of time when we had the money to do so? Okay, that's why we were called niggers. We had the money, and some of us already had land over here. And so the states just, in order for them to make some form of money just to keep a system going, they allowed us to buy the land and just decided to plot to give it to foreigners later. After they took it from us, whether they bought it from us, whether they sent the KKK or some Caucasian militia to come and kill everybody and just take the land or steal the deed or hold them hostage and threaten them and make them go. However, they decided to do it later on. But at this moment during the Homestead Act, they allowed brown people to buy the land just so they would not um, have an economic collapse. So on act, the act of breaking horses, especially wild horses, that's very dangerous. OK, and it still is dangerous today. Especially when you're talking about um, breaking stallions and breaking them during the mating season. They could kill you. Horses get up to and over a thousand pounds. And they can literally strike you with their front hooves or kick you to death. Or give you whiplash from bucking or throw you off. You know, you might land on your neck and get paralyzed or kill. You might land on your back and get paralyzed, break a leg, break an arm. Very dangerous, okay? Law Caucasians do not want to do this. So we take a look and read this. Michael Searles, in Taking Out the Buck and Putting in a Trick, title of the book, states that black cowboys' duty in the morning was to prepare the horses while the white cowboys ate breakfast. Black cowboys were expected to break the wildest and roughest horses. Once tamed, these horses were immediately claimed by white cowboys. They weren't called cowboys. They were called cowhands. Breaking horses was a very dangerous and sometimes deadly task. He also quotes, sometimes their lungs were torn loose by the violent jolting of the stiff-legged bounds of the wild beast they rode, and many busters would spit up blood after a few months. He states that most white cowboys were not capable of breaking these horses. Not really. Um, Cyrus also notes that black cowboys took pride in being able to break these horses. Once these men, the bronze men, relocated from the south to the midwest, their experience in handling livestock attracted much attention from the ranchers. Several cowboys, the bronze ones, became famous because of their roping skills and their ability to tame a horse. Others became famous for being infamous. You had many outlaws that were bronze as well. And they made it cool to be an outlaw. A lot of bronze men made it cool to be a cowboy. Just like how today, um, the, even the lowest bronze people among us, who were the thugs, the bloods, the crips, the gangsters, now you got other races rapping, want to be a thug or a gangster. But nobody wanted to be a thug or a gangster when the Caucasians came over here and started doing that first. Because they were the first gangsters. And the first gangs, even the first ghettos, were made by the Jews. The poor Jews that came over here. But nobody wanted to be that <laughs> until we started doing it. Now everybody rapping, now we want to side their pants. Because we are the ones that bring uh, cultures and new things forward. Everybody wants to copy us. The world wants to copy us and look at us copying other people. But aside from that, we're going to take a quick look at this little video. Um, and this is actually in the UK. And these are uh, two riders being attacked by a wild stallion on their own horses. And a little clip of some um, slightly, oh, some aggressive behavior in some uh, wild horses that these people are trying to tame. As you can see, she's kicking. And this is actually a female. Um, I couldn't find a lot of YouTube videos to where the horse was re like really trying to attack and kill a person um, because obviously in those instances, you know, the person's not going to be recording, they're trying to get out with their live, but um, yeah, so here she tries to strike him and he has the reins so she can't get too close to him. He's trying to keep her walking in a circle because if a horse is continuously moving around you, they cannot buck or kick or strike at you that well. And this is the video of in the UK of a wild um, stallion actually attacking this rider on a horse. Because actually trying to get to the horse as a form of dominance. So this is what we would deal with out in the West too. Do we have West uh, wild horses we had to break here? This is dangerous. She's lucky that her horse responded, you know, relatively calm to that other horse running up in its face like that. Because if her own horse decided to accept the challenge and rear and buck up and fire up she would be in some real danger like seriously especially with those other wild horses following behind and they're just trying to get away this is no joke and that's that wild horse is relatively small just think of like the horse the same size as the one she's on and even when we talk about wrangling cattle it was and still is very dangerous to do especially a charging bull 
it can injure and topple the person that's riding the horse and gore you and the horse we're gonna take a look at this video that has sound on it of some cattle herding um, in the desert and as you can see they, they're out there okay so this is in Arizona they're out in the bush this is what we had to do back in the day this is what a lot of bronze cowmen had to do back in the day a lot of Caucasian did not want to do this they're doing it today because we got pushed out into the major cities and stuff and it's hot back then you just out in the open because ain't no nice warm house to go back to at the end of the day if you're out like on the trail and you're going from state to state you just out there in the wilderness Alright, the cattle to come home off the desert, but before we do that, we'll have to gather them and brand the calves. Our goal for today is to gather as many cattle as possible. Where are you at? So you can't really get a vehicle through this, you have to have a horse, even today. I like to give a little He goes right back after it. Hey, cow. Just like these horses, I do pressure and then release. Now what happened to him, what almost happened to him, is exactly what happened to this guy and this horse. So again, I gotta keep reiterating this because this is important. A lot of Caucasians did not Caucasian, Caucasians did not want to do this work because it's extremely dangerous. Even my own great grandfather, I told him before he died, he actually rode horses and delivered mail. And he actually broke his leg once by falling off of a horse, but he didn't want to go to the Caucasian doctor because you might die. Then we might go to a doctor and not come back out and just be dead. That's how bad it was. So he just let it heal on its own and he lived for the rest of his life. Yeah, that could happen. One one wrong slip, one wrong move, it, it could be over for you. He was lucky. Black Caucasians did not want to deal with this. At most, many of them were ranch hands. They stayed on the ranch. Okay, that's why I said up to a third or more cowboys were bronze. A lot of them didn't want to, all the other race didn't want to do this. It was too dangerous. Especially a lot of them that came over here, the foreigners were new. To America. Now we're going to talk about the actual bronze men who inspire the Western um, genre as a whole, and who uh, most of the genre, you know, what it actually means. Like um, the Lone Ranger. A lot of the Western, what we call icons, are almost directly copied from. To be honest with you. So the first one we're going to look at is this man called Nat Love. And now Love actually wrote an autobiography published in 1907 about his life, okay? And apparently, as we read here, it has all the feel of a classic western, whether a dime novel or a Hollywood film. It is in many ways all of the classic westerns woven into a single story. 
At least that is true of the core chapters of the book. It is quite unlike the classic western in that the narrator begins life as a slave, the first five chapters, and then ends his adventures not as a cowboy on the open range, but as a Pullman porter serving the train riding public of America, with the final chapter, chapter reminiscing about the old days in the lost age of the open range trail drive. So he published this biography before the western genre as we know it, when The Lone Ranger and other such movies came out like the Magnificent Seven and all those other western type movies came out. His autobiography was the foundation of the blueprint for that. They just didn't include the slave part or the ending where he stopped being a cowboy and decided to retire basically. And Nat Love and Bill Pickett and even Bass Freeze were probably not the only bronze men who contributed to the Western genre. These are just the ones who we know who are famous by name. Because in memoirs or interviews published after the open range they closed, as we read here, cattlemen almost invariably make some reference to a black cowboy who was part of their crew. Sometimes he was spoken of simply as a Negro. Sometimes a first name or a nickname is recalled, like Jim, Sam, Big John. It also says most cowboys were white men and many were southern-born whites, but the crews were usually mixed. This in, this in itself was, in the America of the 1860s, a rare phenomenon, and in a curious way, the white cowboys seemed almost proud of it. You know why they seemed proud of it? Because they basically could say, I have one of the best, or I have a bronze man who's really, really good at what he does with us. Now on from that love, Bill Pickett was a bronze man who invented rodeo bulldogging. And bulldogging in a rodeo is wrestling a steer, which is a castrated cow, male cow, to the ground by holding its horns and twisting its neck. So you're doing that with your bare hands, okay? And he actually got the idea um, by watching a bulldog hold a cow in place by biting on its lip and holding it low to the ground. And this top right picture here is actually a picture of him biting the upper lip of a cow, and I guess he's about to bring it down to the ground. So like I said again, a lot of Caucasians um, were not brave enough to grab a cow's horn by his, with his bare hands and arms and actually bring it to the ground. Because these things are big, they're heavy, they're dangerous, these are long horns at the time, and he did it with his bare hands. He was so good at it that a bronze sculpture in 1975 was made to honor him at his induction into the Rodeo Hall of Fame. Then, of course, we have Bass Reeves, who inspired the Lone Ranger, as well, we, uh, like we know. Like how Nat Love inspired the Western genre in general. And one thing I wanted to point out was Nat Love's autobiography, which the Western genre is basically based off of, on his stories and the adventures and everything that the Western genre is about before it even came out. That is characterized in his autobiography. What other person do we know who book or story or novel was stolen by Caucasians and made into major movies and even made its own genre the woke genre when it comes to media The Matrix Sophia Stort which is a bronze woman wrote The Matrix and she wrote The Terminator and she had to take the um, those people to court and they just paid her hush money to not say anything and not say anything about the, about the fact that they basically plagiarized the entire book from her books or plagiarize the entire movies from her books same thing happened with, with Nat Love obviously if his autobiography encompasses the entire western genre minus being a slave they just they just cherry pick some things out before the western genre was even made clearly they copied just like how they made the Lone Ranger based off of Bass Reeves because he was known for his valor for upholding the law and for catching what it says 3,000 Outlaws and Killing 14, that's impressive. He was the first so-called bronze, you know, marshal, and the best. Then we take a look at the Lone Ranger. It says here that he was made as a character to fight evil and establish justice in the West. However, how are you going to fight evil and establish justice in the West at a time where evil and injustice against everyone, really, but especially ethnic Americans in particular, was rampant? Because the Lone Ranger was made in... 1900s, early, mid 1900s. So, you didn't even have justice in fighting evil in real life. So, how are you going to make a character and say that's what you're doing on film and on the radio? No, you not. You cannot base what you've seen on something. I'm sorry, you cannot base what you make on something you haven't seen before. Like with the Black Panther thing, 
Stan Lee is not going to just up and say and admit like, hey, I took it from the Black Panther Party here in America and from the South American, you know, uh, Panther gods here. They're just going to lie and say that it takes place. In- They're not going to just say it, okay? They still haven't admitted that they plagiarized Sophia Stewart's work. So they're not going to blatantly come out and say, yeah, we copied Lone Ranger from Bass Reed. And another thing, see, they mess up because if the Lone Ranger is supposed to be a renegade lawman, how can those two words go together because a renegade is an individual who rejects lawful or conventional behavior? So you're an unlawful lawman? That makes any, that makes no sense. Look, they copy from Bass Reeves, okay? They're, who they say the character is doesn't even make sense. And he's wearing a black mask and he's got the Indian taunting with him because when Bass Reeves ran away from being a slave, he ran um, and lived amongst some mongoloid Indians. That's where they got Tonto from. Because a lot of times the Caucasians were fighting with the Indians about this land thing, but all of a sudden you're gonna take one up as your assistant? And he's just like, yeah, I wanna follow, I wanna be your assistant even though your people are killing my people. No, that makes no sense. They just copied from Bass Reed. And even the first jockeys were bronze. In fact, bronze jockeys and horsemen dominated um, thoroughbred racing in the first uh, Kentucky Derby, okay? because we could ride them very well but eventually like the cowboy image the caucasians were jealous that we made it look so good and just like the caucasians say i want to be a cowboy cowboy was a derogatory term now you want to be a cowboy because it looks so cool to you to be like cowboy and it's like i want to be a cowboy now i want to be a jockey nobody wanted to be a jockey except when we were doing it getting paid well that uh, niggas being jockeys now first we gave them the jockey jockey nobody want to do it now they're doing it well we don't want to do it no more that's what happened so they dropped them they dropped the bronze jockeys and said hey we're gonna bar you from coming in this industry even though they had to shut down some tracks because they had lack of riders and they ended up losing more money they did it anyway just so you wouldn't have so in conclusion even though the spanish were the ones that brought cattle herding and cattle driving over to the americas we were already riding horses here. We were already basically herding bison over here and catching deer over here on horseback. We were breaking horses. We were using them for transportation, to make an economy, for travel, everything. We, we even ate some of them at times when we needed to. So in South America, when we lived in the mountains and such, we had the llamas and alpacas. North America, we had the horses. Okay, and then Middle America, like Mexico, we had some horses. So the Western genre, was actually inspired by us. It couldn't have came from the Spanish because you don't hear anything about Spanish. They didn't invent bulldogging and yet they had they brought cattle over here. And yet they're the ones with cattle, but they didn't invent bulldogging, which is basically grabbing the steer by the horns and throwing it to the ground with your bare hands, with your strength. They weren't doing that over there in Spain. So they didn't invent the Western genre. We invented it because we were very, very good at breaking the wild horses. We were very good at rounding them up. Then all the many adventures that Bass Reeves went on, that Nat Love went on, and in some cases that Bill Pickett went on because he actually starred in two movies. So that made it even more cool for other races, especially Caucasians, wanting to go and be a cowboy and do all that stuff. That's why in a lot, if not most or all of the crews, I'm not gonna say all, but most of the crews where you had a group of cowboys, you always had at least one bronze man amongst them. Because typically he was good or else he wouldn't be there. He's good at what he do. And so what the Caucasians do, they learn from him, like how they, we taught them to farm. So of course he's gonna teach the other the Caucasians like, hey, this is how you break the horse. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And go from there. We were in hot riding horses here for millennia. We've always been riding horses all over the world. Breaking them, we had, all, we had the skills doing this. So don't let anybody tell you the Western drama for Caucasians. When you see in the media, movies, cartoon or cartoons, yeah, shows, all that, and you see all Caucasians, that is false. We were already over in the Midwest, and a lot of the um, bronze people moved from the South to the West to get that land for the, the Homestead Act. So that's all for the Ethnic American channel today. Make sure you check out my Instagram, VZM. It's literally in like almost every post in this video. And, um, just stay tuned for the next um, video.